Hey y'all, hey, welcome back to another episode of Dive. My name is Sherrod, you may know me better as Deep Black. Today, I'm so excited, this is the first time I'm gonna show you my design process. So, I'm gonna walk you through the creation of the Pet Bowl, which was released in February. Now, it's April now, so obviously we're way after the fact. I'm gonna walk you through how I came up with the idea, how I executed it, and how I finished it. And then, maybe in a future video, I'll show you how I refine it. So, let's get started. Any good design project starts with what we call a brief. A brief is just the set of requirements that are needed for this particular design. Now remember, design is the solution of problems within a set of constraints. Or to put it another way, as Steve Jobs said, design is not just how it looks, but how it works. For this pet bowl, I had a few really specific constraints. First and foremost, it had to be from a mold that I already have. That is, I didn't want to make a completely new form for this one. I have quite a library of forms, and I wanted to be able to pull from them and not have to generate something completely new every time, which has a high overhead. Secondly, this design has to have a weighted base. We all know how our pets eat. I've got a cat and my partner has a dog. You know, they don't really care. They, when they get a treat, they just go into it, right? So I wanted something that wouldn't slide across your floor, which I find really annoying. So a weighted base was a must. Lastly, it had to have a really flat base. I really wanted to start getting into vinyl decals for a few specific ideas, and I thought this would be a really good jumping off point. This would also help me tie in my history of icon design as well, which is a fun little crossover from my software days. That's the brief. So the mode of execution. Now, y'all have already seen, I love wheel throwing, I enjoy it, I'm pretty good at it. But wheel throwing presents a lot of disadvantages for production work, production potting we call it. I use a machine called the Jigger and Jolly, or just the Jigger. Uh, it's in fact fairly new technology in the history of ceramics. You know, ceramics is like 20,000 years old. The Jigger was invented somewhere around the 1700s in Europe, and so it's Fairly new, not many people use it or know of it. What it does is it uses a mold and a profile, a blade, on a lever, a levered arm, in order to create pieces that are identical very, very quickly, at least an order of magnitude faster than wheel throwing. So to give you an example, when you're throwing, you might spend, say, t you, of course you prep your clay, then you might spend about 10 minutes let's say making any given piece, it's gotta sit and dry slowly in controlled conditions for about two days, then you have to trim it and hope all of that goes to plan. You know, this is the, lots of opportunities to get cracks and for your tools to slip and all kinds of stuff to happen. Then you have to wait another three to four days for it to get to bone dry and only then can you bisque fire it. In contrast, the jigger, once the clay is prepped, takes about 90 seconds to make any given piece. Then it dries overnight, you pop it out the mold, cleanup takes about five minutes, and then it's ready to fire pretty much the next day. I have pushed it to firing the same day with a few modifications. So it's really, really, really fast. What takes five full days and is kind of risky can be condensed down to really two. So. That's the process I'm gonna be showing you. So here's my mold. It's the spoon rest. The spoon rest is, all, is really what this mold is. I get a lot of use out of this mold. So the first thing I do is use what's called a Giffen grip, just a device to help center it on the wheel and hold it in place. Now this is the profile, the blade for this. It's just the spoon rest, as you can see. What you're looking at is the arm of the jigger. It has a carriage, and that carriage allows you to adjust it in different dimensions. So First, I'm setting the depth of it. Now, like I said, this has to have a weighted base. So what I chose to do, I have these little 3D printed uh, devices that I use for measuring things. I took a stab in the dark and set this depth to 14 millimeters, just a hair over a half inch. Now, normally for comparison, my pieces are between six to 10 millimeters at the very thickest. So then I'm gonna use it to, me to measure the wall thickness. So this I set at 10 millimeters, which is my thickest uh, side, and you'll see why in a minute. It makes a really beautiful look to the piece. So 14 millimeters thick at the base, that's the weighted base, and then 10 millimeter wall thickness is what I decided on. So I tighten all the screws, get it set, check it, and now we're ready to insert some clay and get going. All right, so here's our mold filled with clay. Let me know in the comments if you're curious about how I fill it. I can show you that. I adjust a tiny bit of water for lubrication. Then we bring the blade down, and it's just acrylic, and it cuts away and, importantly, compresses the clay as it spins. 
I take a few passes at it and then scrape off the excess clay. Then I take care of the rim. It's uh, very satisfying to look at. Happens sort of all in one go. And then after that, I just clean up the rim. Like I said, I wanted a really round rim on this one. Now the most important part, I use one of these uh, super flexible, this is the red mud tools, the most flexible one they have, rib, and I flatten out a really flat base on here. And I really take my time to make sure it's beautifully smooth and flat, and then we're done. And then, you know, I can't just make one. These are prototypes after all, so you wanna have a few to play with. So I made a few. This is the process sped up, I think 20 times. It took almost exactly two minutes start to finish. Bear that in mind. Next, I let the pieces sit out overnight, just in the open air, and they dry to a perfect leather hard, and now they're ready to be cleaned up. So, like I said, it's easy, you just pop them out, they come right out of the mold. The plaster absorbs the water in the wet clay, and by the time, you know, the next day rolls around, it's perfectly leather hard. This one wasn't as flat as I wanted, so I take a piece of sandpaper and really flatten them out. Now, I thought I'd be able to use a sponge and really round that rim, but I found out pretty quickly that that wasn't going to work, and I switched to just a simple loop tool just to give me a beveled edge that, that I could then uh, wipe clean and smooth. I wanted these corners to be nice and round because some pets, like cats, some animals like cats, have uh, a thing with their whiskers touching surfaces, and so I wanted it to be nice and gentle, plus I think it's a nice look. So a quick check to make sure it all looks nice and even, which it does, and then rinse, wash, repeat. I let them bone dry overnight, and then I bisque fire them to cone 04 very slowly. It takes about 26 hours or so, maybe 22 hours, and then another like 16 to cool, and then we pull them out the kiln, and that's what we have here. This is the bisque fired form. Like I said before, I wanted it to have nice round curves, which it does. It has a nice heft to it. Uh, it actually feels very satisfying, but that obviously that heft is functional. And the interior is nice and smooth and flat, which is exactly what we need to adhere vinyl decals to it. All right, so the next step after this is the decals themselves. So I have a background in graphic design, visual design. I've done graphic design, photography, software design. I know how to make the visual assets. I've never used like a cutting machine, a CNC like this. Uh, this was new to me. Not that hard, but it took quite a lot of trial and error. So I'm using a Silhouette Cameo 4 that I got on Black Friday for a good deal. Uh, as recommended to me by Kenny Singh, I think that's how you say his last name, uh, Turn Studio, at Turn Studio on Instagram. He makes fabulous work. It took me, I would say, about six hours of just constant failure before I got something I was actually happy with. A little tip for you, don't ever think you're going to be good at something the first time around. You're almost certainly not. Save yourself the heartache and just be bad until you're good, right? So I was bad for a few hours at this, but eventually I got it to cut the way I wanted. First, I couldn't get it to feed through right. I couldn't figure out how to set the settings on the blade that it uses to cut. It was cutting all the way through the paper. Then it wasn't cutting the paper at all. It was passing back and forth, child. It was a whole lot of mess, but we got there eventually and it turned out great. So there were three designs, well, four, that I really wanted to prototype. I wanted the cat paw, a dog paw, and then I had the idea of doing a monthly exclusive design, so February, love, romance, hearts is what I chose, groundbreaking. Um, but then I also wanted to test names. I had the idea of doing custom names. We'll circle back to that one. The next step after it spits out your decals and they're looking good is to transfer them. Now, strictly speaking, you don't have to do this, but I quite like this. You'll use a piece of what's called transfer adhesive or transfer paper to move the entire decal to the surface that you're going to actually finally place it on. The reason we do this is just, it's easier to align. You don't have to worry about the thing like folding over on itself or anything. Um, you can in fact get very precise alignment with the transfer paper. Like I said, you don't have to, but I, I like this process. So I use the transfer paper to help me align it onto the spoon rest. Once it's centered, I press out all the air bubbles, peel off the transfer paper, because that was its job. And the next part is to remove the parts that are the positive and negative of the design. So the way this works is the vinyl decal acts as a physical barrier, a resist. You know, like we paint on wax resist or latex resist. It's the same idea. It prevents the glaze from touching the clay and thus being absorbed. So the parts that I pull away, everything that is exposed will be glazed. Everything where the vinyl remains will not be glazed and will be raw. I will peel them up at the very end, which I'm going to show you here. 
So it took me a minute to wrap my head around this and make sure I was doing it correctly. But once I did it a couple times, no problem at all. Like I said, I wanted to test the cat's paw, a dog's paw, which are the permanent designs, and then a monthly design, the heart, and then this name thing. Spoiler alert, it did not work at all. There were myriad problems with this name, but that's why we prototype, and that's why we do things over and over and over again until we get them right. Not everything is gonna work the first time. Please to say everything else did, but not that name. All right, the next step is to wax it. I needed to wax the underside and the rim. So in contrast to most of my work, I wanted this one to have a sort of a brighter appearance. I wanted the outside to be glazed as well as the interior with an exposed rim and of course a naked bottom. Um, now the way I did this was I took a pencil and marked about maybe a quarter of an inch or so off the base of the piece. Now I know my glazes very, very well. They're very static, they don't move, but Glazes in general, physics, has a tendency to pool at the base of a curve. And so I didn't want that to accidentally stick to the kiln shelf because then it would be there permanently. So I marked that off and then I wax it using one of these foam brushes, which I absolutely love. Shout out to Sula at Golden Ratio Clay Works for that tip. I also recommend thinning out your wax resist uh, as thin as you can get it, which just with water, because it will go on very, very smooth. You see it sort of glides on. I then go and use the brush at an angle to wax the rim of the piece. I do this at an angle so that it doesn't, and with a light touch, so that it doesn't spill over onto the edge on the inside or outside. All right, now it's time to glaze. I know, it's been a journey. So I mix up some sapphire. I always say this, glazing is mechanical. It is physical. You need to figure out the mechanics of how you're going to get this piece to the glaze or vice versa before you start. Otherwise you kind of panic and it kind of goes wrong every time. So I started this one the way I often do things by filling the inside first, pour it out. And to do the outside, I thought I'll use a car dent puller. This is a trick I learned from Joe Thompson at Old Forge Creations. He has fantastic tips. I've used this on plates successfully before. This worked once and only once on this pet bowl. So the idea is that, you know, it suctions to the base of the piece and you can just dip it and pull it out easily. For my mats, I have to dip twice. It's two thin layers. This did not work. I mean, it worked once. It worked this one time that I caught on camera. The next time I tried it, it it's so heavy, it pulled itself off of the dent puller, fell into the glaze and made an enormous mess. In fact, the second time I did it in a bucket, it was a complete disaster. So, I moved away from this technique. Um, but, you know, it's, it's important to try different things. For the next set of tests, I tried Solar, my flame orange glaze, and I decided to use a pair of glazed tongs, you know, which have sort of a wide shoulder for gripping things, and I decided to just dip it in a bucket. And this worked pretty well, except I immediately realized you need a full bucket of glaze to pull this off, because you need lots of room in there to maneuver. So I knew this would work like for now, but not long term. Um, what I do now is actually pour it into a small bowl and just cover the whole thing with glaze, let it sit, pull it out. Much easier. But this is why we prototype, right? We're trying to find the best way to do these things. Now for the heart, I wanted to do something special. I wanted to use I'm thinking romance, love, a callback to when I invented this glaze, rose quartz. I wanted to apply this ombre effect to it. You will have seen rose quartz on the possible, first of all, um, sort of a reference to when I first released it in back in February of 2022, I think. Boy, this was a mess. So the way I apply rose quartz is with a spray atomizer. I put the glaze in and literally just blow and it creates a nice jet for me to apply. Ordinarily this works beautifully. I had such a tough time with this, I have to tell you. I could barely get it onto the outside okay. It made an enormous mess. Then I shifted it and tried to do it on the inside. It still made a mess. I didn't get it on as evenly as I wanted to. Uh, I decided that would be the end of that one. But it's good to try these things just so you know. So you're not like in a situation where you're doing it for a client and it's failing all over the place, right? So after glazing, the very last step is clean up and what's called weeding. This is where you take like a very fine needle tool, almost like a dental pick, and you just pull off all of the pieces of vinyl. So for the heart and for the cat's paw, dog paw, not a big deal. It worked pretty quickly, pretty well. Child, that name. This is how I knew that name wasn't gonna work. First of all, the letters were 
far too thin. They came out razor thin and it was so hard to get that needle on just the right place to be able to pick it up. It would slip and chip and the other problem is that my glaze is matte. This glaze, Sapphire, is a matte glaze. It's high alumina, high refractory, so it had a tendency to come up in chunks, especially with these little fine details. These sharp corners of the font turned out to be a big problem. Again, this is why we prototype, this is why we test, so that we know it will work when we need to do it for real. With all that work behind us, there was nothing left but to load it, fire it, my program is very, very specific and it lets me get these bright colors. It takes about nine hours start to finish and then about 16 hours to cool. So here's how it turned out. This is the cat's paw, it turned out just like I wanted it to. Looks great, as you can see, the glaze comes right up to the rim, which is exactly why I applied the wax resist at an angle. It really looks exactly how I wanted it to. There's the underside. I'm really pleased with that. Here is the Rose Quartz Ombre. Because you've not seen any pictures on Instagram, you know it didn't really work. I mean, it looks okay, right? It looks okay here, but the outside is not really what I was going for. Eh, eh. It's just one of those things where maybe if I spent another few weeks on it, it would be there, but mm, no. You gotta sometimes know when to let stuff go. And this one, I let go. But it was a nice try. So let's talk about the name. Here's how it looks. Now, spoiler alert, on Instagram, I did end up working this out using a completely different font and much larger. But you can see it worked okay. It's just really small, so not proportionate to the scale of the piece. Uh, the letters are quite small, and you can see how tiny some of these details are. Like that, the inside of that A, it was a pain, a pain in the ass. The dots didn't really work, none of that really worked. So I very quickly realized I had to let this go. And then what I even tried, one of them, was leaving the vinyl on, leaving the resist on, thinking it would just burn off. Well, not really. It did burn off, but it, the glaze that was on top of it just stayed there. So there was kind of no point to it. So I quickly learned that this wasn't gonna work. I pivoted to a different font. That font works much better, although not perfect. But this is why we prototype. This is why we test. Now, a couple months later, this piece has been offered, it's going well, and there's a new version of it, which maybe we'll talk about some other time. Well, that's it. I hope y'all enjoyed this look into my design process from start to finish. One thing I wanna mention, I filmed all of this in real time. As I was working through these ideas and processes and technologies and all this stuff, I wanted to film it and show you how it really works for me as I'm working. So if you like this video, please be sure to like, subscribe, comment down below. Let me know what your favorite part was and what you'd like to see next. I got lots more coming. That's it. Uh, I need to like record a real outro. Follow me on Instagram at deepblack.shop. I don't know. That's it. That's it. All right. Bye.